So I was being inspired by um, the study and practice of the safe participants in course 1B that I've been facilitating um, this semester. And in the last few weeks, we've going, been going through the topics of um, the Four Noble Truths or the Four Truths of the Aryas and the Eightfold Noble Path. Um, and just hearing their reflections on um, the inspiration of seeing a map of the path to enlightenment and also how it pertains to how they can tangibly put um, the teachings into practice right now was very inspiring for me. Um, and also highlighted with some of their questions to me about this, that my knowledge specifically on the layout of the Eightfold Noble Path is a bit lacking. So it is, drove me to um, want to look a bit deeper and go back to the teachings that I've had on it and also look a bit further. So I'll be going through that today and eight more after this. Um, so today I would go through uh, right view um, as the first aspect of the Eightfold Noble Path, which is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And as just an introduction to this, um, there's a beautiful passage um, out of a teaching by um, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi um, that uh, sums up how the Eightfold Path relates to the Dharma in general, which I thought to share. And he says, the essence of the Buddha's teachings can be summed up in two principles, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. In the structure of the teachings, these two principles lock together in an indivisible unity called the Dharma Vinaya, the Dharma and Doctrine, or the, Dharma and, the Doctrine and Discipline, or in brief, the Dharma. The internal unity of the Dhamma is guaranteed by the fact that the last of the Four Noble Truths, the truth of the way or the truth of the path, is the Eightfold Noble Path, while the first factor of the, of the Noble Eightfold Path, right view, is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Thus, the two, princi the two principles penetrate and include one another. The formula of the Eight Truths, of the Four Noble Truths containing the Eightfold Path and the Noble Eightfold Path containing the Four Truths. I find these things very joyful um, to come across when how things fit together um, kind of in a, in a tapestry um, come to light. So that was helpful for me. Um, and when Venerable Children gave a commentary to the Eightfold Path in, I think, the Easy Path series um, a few years ago, um, she read from the Great Forty Sutta um, from the Mashima Nikaya in the Pali Canon. Um, and what's beautiful about this sutta is that it lays out um, three parts for each aspect. Um, the aspect, what the aspect is not, so wrong view, wrong livelihood, wrong effort. What that aspect is in terms of mundane aspects, so what we as ordinary beings can practice right now. And then the super mundane aspect, what um, Aryas who have already realized emptiness, how they practice this. Um, so it's quite wonderful. Um, so starting out with right view, uh, it's interesting that this falls under the, uh, the high training of wisdom, which um, in the normal layout, we start with ethical conduct. And then based on that, we could then go to concentration. And then once we have some facility with these two, then we go to uh, the high training of wisdom. But here we have it right at the beginning of the path. Um, and again, Bhikkhu Bodhi gives a beautiful rendition of why this is so. And here he uses this, one of the stock phrases from um, the Great Forty Sutta, where he says, right view is the forerunner of the entire path, the guide for all the other factors. It enables us to understand that our starting point, our destination, and all the successive landmarks um, that, we, that we pass as our practice advances. To attempt to engage in the practice without the foundation of right view is to risk getting lost in the futility of undirected movement. Doing so might be compared to wanting to drive to some place without consulting a road map or an experienced driver. One might get into the car and start to drive, but we might go in the exact opposite of the direction that we're wanting to get to. And then he also cautions us about the implications of holding wrong views, that even if that wrong view is vague, it could lead us to courses of actions that will end in suffering. On the other hand, if we have right view, it will steer us in the direction of creating the causes for happiness, which we all want. 
So though our conceptual orientation towards the world might seem innocuous or inconsequential, if it's wrong, when looked at closely, it reveals itself to be the decisive determination of the whole course of our future development. So it's so important that we discern what wrong views to discard and what right views to adopt. So what is wrong view? Um, in the sutta, the Buddha lays out that wrong view is believing that our actions have no ethical dimension, that our actions don't bring results, that there's no continuity of consciousness, that there's no rebirth, that there's no law of cause and effect, there's no karma and its effects, that everything ends at the time of death, the nihilistic viewpoint, that other realms of existence don't exist, that liberation is impossible, and that defilements inhere in the nature of the mind. We can't get rid of them. They're just part of our human condition. We get angry. What to do? So we can see how this worldview would really lead us down a wrong path, and it's quite depressing <laughs> that it's such a narrow view of just what we have right here, right now, this life, that then what's the point of practicing ethical conduct in the basis of that? So really, there's nothing more than just seeking the endless search for fleeting pleasures. Whereas in contrast, mundane right view, which as ordinary beings we can practice right now, is the exact opposite of this. So it's a firm belief that our actions do have an ethical dimension, that our actions matter, and they bring results. That there is a continuity of consciousness, that there is rebirth, and other, other realms of existence do exist that we can be reborn into. That there is a law of cause and effect. That liberation is indeed possible and that defilements are in no way the nature of the mind. Of the mind that we can eradicate them when we have the right antidotes and techniques to do so. And also that there are, being, there are beings that have done this. And we can see the example of the Buddha, but also other practitioners and teachers that we have here right now. So this is incredibly inspiring in contrast, and it provides us a map of how we can live our lives. Mm. And so translating from the Pali, Bhikkhu Bodhi said that mundane right view literally is the right view of the ownership of action. So it brings us the flavor of the emphasis on uh, the law of cause and effect. Um, and he says that the mundane right view emphasizes, um, is, is often encapsulated in the suttas by the statement, Beings are owners of their actions, the heirs of their actions. They spring from their actions, are bound to their actions, and are supported by their actions. Wherever deeds they do, good or bad, of those they shall be heirs. And so here we can see that mundane right view um, establishes two key principles of the Buddhist worldview um, that are necessary for the foundation of the entire path to awakening the law of cause and effect, that our actions have an ethical dimension, and the idea of rebirth or the indestructible continuity of consciousness. So how do we put this into practice? Um, and as um, one of the participants in the SAFE course specifically asked, how do I generate wisdom? How do I generate this in the context of right view? And so here we're directed to understand the distinction between unwholesome, or non-virtuous actions and virtuous action and virtuous or wholesome actions, and we can do that by learning about the um, ten destructive actions and the ten constructive actions that are laid out in the section on karma in the Lama. And based on that understanding, we try and practice um, refraining from the destructive ones and engaging in the constructive ones. Sounds quite simple, but it's quite a lot. <laughs> Not so easy. Um, but definitely possible. Um, and in his commentary also, Bhikkhu Bodhi emphasizes the need to understand the roots from which our actions spring. So this is um, the virtuous mental factors, such as love, compassion, wisdom, and the non-virtuous mental factors, such as ignorance, anger, and attachment. So here there's a whole wealth of stuff to work with to deepen our right view and wisdom in terms of awareness of how we actually move in the world, um, seeing for creating causes of happiness or causes of suffering in terms of are we doing constructive actions or deconstructive ones. And also getting insight into what motivates us to act in terms of um, the mental factors, the flavors of our mind. You know, when I'm angry, I'm more inclined to do blah, blah, blah. 
or when I'm happy and relaxed and peaceful, I'm more inclined to do this. Um, so this motivated me or directed me to ask myself, like, how much do I live according to right view myself? Like, I live in precepts, and I try to engage in virtue, and I try to refrain from non-virtue. But in terms of deeply internalizing that all my actions have an ethical dimension, on a, that's quite something to ponder more deeply for myself. Um, that it's just I find it so easy to move an automatic in, in various elements that it, it's having to really come back and ask myself for my motivation and look closely at what's um, driving me to, s to speak, to act, or even my thinking. Um, and then to sum up the, the super mundane right view, or those, uh, the, the way that the right view is practiced by those who have a realization of emptiness, areas, um, is, is understanding and then penetrating the Four Noble Truths. Um, and this is specifically with uh, the power of serenity or calm abiding and special insight. Um, but, um, and speaking for myself, that's not where my level of practice is, but learning about um, studying and trying to see how I can bring in elements of the formal truths into my practice right now is very helpful as well. Uh, specifically, understanding my current situation in terms of the first two truths, true dukkha and the origins of dukkha. So I found, uh, yeah, hopefully the inspiration from the safe participants has uh, flowed through me to you, um, and may we all find ways to develop right view in our practice. You said that uh, the Four Noble Truths are included in the Eightfold Path. Uh, could you explain how they're included, especially how the first two truths are included in the Eightfold Path? <laughs> Yeah, um, briefly I can. Uh, from what Bhikkhu Bodhi wrote, he said that right view, can, as um, the way that it's practiced on the super mundane level, is the direct, is the penetration, the realization of those four truths. So the Four Noble Truths are encapsulated in the super mundane right view, the first aspect of the Eightfold Path. 